recording in pro so we we deal with something called as loop transfer function this loop transfer function is the product of feed forward or open loop transfer function and the feedback transfer function now i want to emphasize this because please understand you have the open loop transfer function g of s we try to convert this open loop transfer function into a closed loop transfer function so this becomes g of s h of s this is output this is input plus minus and when we are trying to find out the the pole travel based on an external gain k what we want to find out is how these poles travel based on changes in the magnitude of k so we are going to look at the the closed loop transfer function which is gs divided by 1 plus gs hs this is the closed loop transfer function but if you look at the command that we enter when we study it in matlab we are actually using this and when we do the root locus please understand we always assume unity feedback for root locus we assume h of s is equal to 1 and the reason h of s is 1 is because we assume whatever we have in the output gets fed back to the summing junction so there are different ways of analyzing uh, the system now complex number algebra sometimes is very useful because please understand the poles of this transfer function the poles of the transfer function are complex so s values in general are complex and it is important to note that finally we are trying to study where the poles are on the real and imaginary axis so this is called as the s plane if my poles are over here if my poles are over here system is stable if my poles are over here system is unstable and if my poles are on the imaginary axis the system is simply stable and as an engineer what we want to do is we want to have poles as far as possible on the left hand side because that increases the stability margin now one thing i want you to understand is we never know the system dynamics completely there is always going to be some approximation there is always going to be some unmodeled dynamics there is always going to be some external disturbance we want to make sure that even though these uncertainties are reality we our system is still stable our system can behave the way the way we want it can meet the performance specs it can meet the goals the way we want that's why what we do is we assume in general the poles are imaginary now if you have complex poles which has real part and imaginary part you can analyze the the pole locations pole travel 
and in general transfer functions using the complex number theory. And the important part which I would like to specify and I would like to tell you here, it's complex number can be represented as the amplitude and phase. Now, what do I mean by amplitude and phase? And this is super duper important. This is amplitude. And this guy is phase. So whenever you have a complex signal or a complex uh, pole, uh, which has real and imaginary part, you can always represent that complex number by an amplitude and the phase. And amplitude and phase is this concept is routinely used in signal analysis because we are trying to study if we supply an input, what would transfer function do to that input? Would transfer function take that input and amplify? Would transfer function take that input and shrink? Or whether that transfer function would take the input and either delay or advance? And transfer function, again, can be assumed in general to be complex. So complex number algebra usually is super duper helpful. Now, the, here is the concept of phase angle. Phase angle, just like four quadrant, uh, we can assume the phase angle to vary from zero to 360 degrees. It can be from zero to 90, 90 to 180, 180 to 270, and 270 to 360. But here is something important that I want you to understand that integer multiple of 360 degrees may be added or subtracted. So now please try to understand what I mean by this. Imagine I, if I have a sine signal, sine theta. I differentiate this and now say I have a cosine theta. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to plot this sine signal And I'm going to plot this cosine signal. One thing to be observed is this cosine signal is maximum when theta is equal to zero. Sine signal is maximum when theta is equal to zero. However, this sine signal is maximum when theta is equal to 90 degrees. So what that means is there is this 90 degree phase shift between the sine and cosine. So let me ask you this question. It's sine leading the signal or cosine leading the signal? So which comes first? So if you look at this signal, which signal is achieving the maximum value first? Cosine. Cosine of 0 is 1, right? Sine of 90 is 1, right? So sine theta, what it means is cosine is leading by 90 degrees. Remember this. So if you want to find out whether which signal is leading or lagging, what I want you to do is I want you to find out the angles when that signal reaches the maximum value. And note which signal reaches maxima first. And that is the signal that is leading. That comes first. Even though we got the cosine from the derivative of sine, but if you look at the way the waveform is, when theta is equal to zero, sine is zero, but cosine is one. When, when theta is equal to 90 degrees, cosine, cosine is zero and sine is one. So that's why 
cosine is leading so cosine theta is leading sine theta by 90 degree everyone with me so far now next thing is how do you convert a complex number or how do you multiply a complex number how do you divide a complex number so the idea is a complex number or a complex signal can be represented as magnitude e to the i theta and now division multiplication addition is super simple so for an example if you have r1 which has magnitude just r1 if you have r2 which has magnitude r2 e raised to i theta 2 then you can multiply these two which would actually the exponents will get added you can divide these two so the exponent will get subtracted so addition multiplication and division can be done easily when you express complex number in this form and probably all of you are aware of Euler's identity r1 is equal to r1 cosine theta plus i sine theta so this will become like this this is theta this is r1 so if you have a complex number you can represent that using the euler's identity as r1 e to the i theta 1 and then you can represent that on the complex plane one thing to note for products magnitude multiply and phase angles add for quotient magnitude divide and phase angle subtract now so how do we perform this complex analysis now in what in something that you should keep in mind is when we are trying to do the frequency domain analysis when we are trying to do the frequency domain analysis we replace this s by a function which is called uh, j omega so what we do is we, we replace this by j omega so this is the transfer function and this is the representation for frequency analysis now this looks a very simple substitution uh, but but there is little bit uh, theory behind it so what i want to talk about is think about you have a simple system say a spring mass system you have a spring mass system here you have k you have m if you recollect the transfer function for this guy is something like this transfer function for this guy is something like this now what i want to do is i want to change the input that is supplied to this transfer function which means what i want to do is I want to supply initially a constant signal. Then I want to supply a signal that is changing slowly. I want to supply a signal that is changing quickly. Then I want to supply a signal that has some changing component, some constant component, and so on. So at the end, at the output, what I want to find out is how this input 
gets transferred into output and how does output change if I change the frequency of this particular system. Now what I mean by that. So let me give you a simple example. Imagine that I have a spring mass system and the natural frequency of vibration, which means if I displace this mass, let it oscillate, it will continue to oscillate at certain frequency. That frequency is called as natural frequency. In the absence of damping, this frequency will be constant, which is square root of k over m. So it will be something like this. So it will be square root of k over m. Now, if I apply a forcing function, so here is the forcing function, say sine. So I'm going to apply a forcing function, which is sine omega t. And omega is less than omega n. You would observe the output response would be at omega. Now, as we go close to this natural frequency, the system response would actually start amplifying. When the frequency is equal to natural frequency, when omega is equal to omega n, then the system response will be unbounded. And one way to study this is using something called as Bode plot. So what we can do is we can use something called as the Bode diagram. to understand how does system behave if we change the input frequency and what would be the response of the output. And this output response is characterized again in terms of two parameters. One is magnitude and other one is phase. So you can actually look at whether the, uh, the output is amplified or if the output is attenuated or output is leading or output is lagging. So all these questions can be studied by something called as this Bode diagram. And the important part and which I just want to talk about and emphasize is magnitude is also called as the gain. And gain and phase are two important parameters that are studied when we look at design of control systems. So I just want to emphasize this. There is something called magnitude, which is nothing but gain and phase. So for linear systems, magnitude and phase, they play a super duper important part uh, when analysis. So from complex uh, number algebra, you can find out the magnitude is nothing but the, <coughs> the absolute value of the transfer function and phase angle is nothing but once you find out the m and jm, you can do the tan inverse of it, and then you can find out what phase it is. Now, please note, typically, there is magnification, which means the output is greater than the input. And phase typically is leading, just like the thing that what I said about cost. Now I want to go to the same example and I want to perform the analysis using a transfer function. So for an example, my transfer function is x is equal to x dot. 
plus u of t. I want to find out the transfer function for this guy. So this is going to look like if I have just have the derivative term. So for for minute, just think about this guy is zero. This guy is zero. So x dot is nothing but s times capital X and X of S. And this is going to be U of T. And what I want to do is I want to perform uh, output divided by input. So I would get one over S is equal to output divided by input. So my transfer function in this case is one over s. So I would put this like one over s and then I would feed my sinusoidal signal over here. Now what would happen to the phase and gain uh, once I apply this transfer function? Please note this transfer function is the transfer function of integrator. So what that means is whatever signal I'm feeding in from the input side would be integrated and I would get an output. So for an example, if I were to feed in sine omega t, integration of sine omega t is minus cosine omega t multiplied by yeah sine over divided by omega so this is what it would look like if i supply it with cosine cosine will become sine and this integration would continue so if you were to plot the body diagram of this integrator if you were to plot the body diagram of this integrator please observe What's going to happen is as frequency is zero, say as S is equal to J omega is equal to zero, you are going to have very high output. And as S goes on increasing, your output will go on decreasing. So if you look at the Bode diagram of an integrator, this is what you are going to observe. On the other hand, if you have a differentiator, which is given by just S, and if you plot the Bode diagram, you would observe the Bode diagram of an integrator is basically, it will start with zero and it will go up. And phase, depending upon if it's a derivation derivative, it would be lagging, it would be leading. If it's integration, it will be leading. So you can actually plot the Bode diagram of the transfer function S. You can plot the Bode diagram of transfer function one over S, and that should be able to give you a nice Bode plot. So this is the same example that I discussed a moment ago. So we have an undamped simple oscillator. The equation for this undamped single oscillator is my double dot plus ky is equal to u. If you look at the transfer function, this is what you get as the transfer function. This is the external forcing. And then we want to see as the forcing frequency gets changed, how does the response change? And this analysis is kind of performed using the complex number and algebra, but you will get the exact same result if you were to plot the Bode diagram. And I'll show it to you in just a second. So what needs to happen is you would replace the S by J omega. You'll get this term. The amplitude uh, is nothing but the absolute value of the transfer function. And then if you want to find out the phase, 
what you will do is you will find out the phase when the system uh, external frequency is less than omega, uh, less than natural frequency. External frequency omega is less than omega n, and external frequency omega is greater than omega n. And once you perform this analysis, this is what you are going to get. Now, what I want to do is, I want to quickly show you how this whole analysis, what we did, can be done using a simple transfer function body plot analysis. So at this point, uh, I'm going to share my screen and please open MATLAB. So please go to MATLAB. And in MATLAB, what I want you to do is say num7 is equal to 1. Then 7 is equal to 1, 0, 1. Transfer function 7 is equal to TF. Num 7, 10, 7. And what I want you to do is CISO tool. TF7. Now, what I want to do is I want you to observe this body diagram. And please note that this body diagram shows a sharp peak that goes to infinity uh, when the frequency is equal to the natural frequency. So in the previous problem, M is equal to 1. K is equal to 1. So square root of K over M is 1, which means the natural frequency is 1. Can you see when the frequency is 1, 10 to the power 0 is 1, the magnification is infinite. So there is this big peak over here. As omega is less than omega n as omega is less than omega n the response is still bounded are you with me so far as the omega exceeds omega n the response is attenuated now this since this is in db it might be a little bit confusing but once again please try to understand db is one way of representing huge number onto a small scale so what you see here is 0 db 10 db 20 db those are huge numbers 50 db 250 db 250 db is let me let me give you an example i'm talking if you were to measure the sound pressure intensity of my talk, which is basically the out displacement of the microphone recorded, it will be anywhere between 25 to 30 dB. If you go on to this Williams Gateway Airport and stand next to the aircraft engine that is running, that will be about 300 to 350 dB. Do you agree with me? So when I'm talking, that is about 30 dB, 20 to 30 dB. When you go stand next to the aircraft, 
that is about 250 to 300 dB. So this much amount of variation can be represented on that graph. Are you with me? It is not possible to express these variation on a linear scale. That's why we use a dB scale because we can actually compare small response and very big response on the same chart. Are you with me? So one thing I want to talk to you about is look at the phase. Can you see that initially the phase was zero degrees, which means the output was in sync with input. You supplied the input, you got the output, everything was in sync. As the frequency change, as the frequency change, specifically it transitioned below the natural frequency and went on to above natural frequency, that phase shift all of a sudden became minus 180. Are you with me so far? Now, phase, so I, I want you to think about this for a second. I want you to visualize. Initially, phase was zero, okay? And please understand, this is leading, okay? Going, this is leading, this is lagging. It became minus 180. So what started happening? Output started to lag. So that's why what you have is minus 180. If output was leading, if the output was leading, it will be plus 90 or uh, plus 180 or plus 270. That means the output is leading. But now what happened? It became minus 180, which means output started lagging. Everyone understood this? So that's what I want you to observe. And then you have the pole locations. So please observe. These are the locations on the root locus. And you can see that as you pull the roots, the only way those roots can travel, they are on the imaginary axis. So basically the poles cannot go anywhere. They will have to stay on the imaginary axis. Now, the next part of this is design of lead and lag compensators. But what I want to do is, before we do that, since we are at MATLAB, I want you to do this exercise real quick. So please go to MATLAB. By the way, uh, everyone was able to get uh, this result. So I'm gonna share my screen and actually show you what I have. Were you able to get this result? Okay, now since online students, okay, now what I want to do is, I want to do something else. If you have a differentiator, if you have a differentiator, what you have is uh, your transfer function is going to be just S. That would be the, the differentiator. So you, if you were to look at the body plot of a differentiator, it will be a straight line. If you look at the body plot of an integrator, it will also be a straight line. So I would, I would recommend that you can do the body plot of the integrator and you can do the body plot of the, the differentiator and, and just see how this works. So let me do just one, okay? So num uh, eight is equal to one, then uh, eight is equal to 
1 comma 0 or oh, then 8 so then i would do tf 8 is equal to tf num 8 then 8 and I want you to do CISO tool. CISO tool. Or you can just do body for that matter. Body TF8. So this is a differentiator. And I want you to see the, the body plot. Okay, now there's so many uh, things open. Uh, I don't know which body plot is. Let me just do C sources. That will mix. Okay, are you with me? This is the body plot of a differentiator. Everyone, online students, can you see this? Okay, now my question to you is very simple and answer this very carefully. If I have a differentiator, what is the pole of a differentiator? What is the pole of a differentiator? What is a pole of a differentiator? Does differentiator S have a denominator, which is S divided by one, right? which means in the denominator, there is no S, which means there is no pole. Are you with me? So this is super duper important because when we study the lead and lag compensator, this is something you should keep in mind. If you have a differentiator, you do not have any poles. What you have is zeros. Do you agree with me? Differentiator, does not have any poles. It only has zeros. What does that zero do? And this is super duper important. That zero, so if you were to add a zero, that zero would actually reduce the magnification. Can you see that as frequency goes on, the magnitude is going down, 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 which means if you add, this is very important. If you add a zero to transfer function, if you add a zero artificially to a transfer function, the response will be attenuated and you will add phase of minus 90. Are you with me so far? If you, if you basically, uh, add uh, the, 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 if you add the transfer function, a zero to a transfer function, you are going to get minus 90 degree phase and you are going to get uh, an attenuation of the magnification. So basically the magnitude will go down. Next thing which I want to talk about is imagine what would happen if you do the exact same thing for integrator, so num 9 is equal to 1 and then 9 is equal to 1 comma 0. 
and TF9 is equal to TF num 9 10 9 CSO tool yeah Huh? Uh, did we do the oh previous one so okay we did integrator so my I apologies so this should uh no tf8 yeah 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 tf so i did this is in so so i made a mistake so the pre i did the integrator now what i want to do is i just want to do a differentiator so the differentiator is going to be s one comma zero and now i don't know if this and this will be one yeah so so previously we did the integrator so integrator what this is what integrator does from the body diagram now let's look at what differentiator does so if you have an integrator Okay, now you can see that if you have a differentiator, it will add 90 degree uh, uh, phase and it will actually amplify the response. So, as you can see, initially it was minus 20 because when S is equal to zero, the amplification is zero, magnification is zero. And as S goes on increasing, as frequency increases, the, the response increases. Now here uh, you have 90 degree. You can so if you have a derivative, if you if you add a zero, uh, you add 90 degree of phase, and you basically amplify the response. If you add an integrator, you add minus 90 degree of phase, and you actually uh, reduce the response. So I think I explained it in the wrong way, but please try to understand that this is the response of the derivative. This is the response of when transfer function is equal to S. When transfer function is S, you can see in the body diagram, magnitude goes on increasing. And you once you have a differentiator, you are adding 90 degree phase to the system. On the other hand, if you add integrator, uh, basically the magnitude drops down the magnitude drops down and you add 90 minus 90 degree of phase to the system response. So what it means is if you were to add the zero, if you were to add the zero, you are actually performing some type of a differentiation operation. If you add a pole, then you are performing some type of integration operation. So this is something that I want you to understand. So and once again, if I didn't make this clear, this is plus 90. Plus 90 means the output is advancing. Output is advancing. Earlier, it was minus 90, which means the output is retarding. Are you with me? This is advancing the output. And yeah, in, uh, the integrator is retarding the output. Okay. My online students, uh, everyone clear? So please note, um, I while explaining, I made a mistake. This is for the derivative. So if you have a differentiator or if you are just adding the zero, what that means is you are going to amplify the response and you, got, you are going to add a positive phase. If you add an integrator, the response is going to be diminishing. It will be decreasing and you will add minus 90 degree to the phase. So that is the point which I would like to make. Any questions from my online students?
yes adding a zero it's something similar to differentiation operation and adding a pole is something similar to the integration operation but here the important part is if someone asks me this is very important what is the zero of differentiator the answer is zero are you with me that transfer function is zero when s is equal to zero so if this is something important that to remember what is the zero of a differentiator the zero of the differentiator is zero what is the pole of the integrator the pole of the integrator is zero everyone understood this so that is uh, and i will actually take an example and i will show you what happens once you add the pole and once you add the zeros because compensators which is nothing but either a lead compensator or a lag compensator is nothing but adding poles and zeros to the transfer function so we'll talk about it in the, the next discussion So, so if you if you look at uh, the next part, is here comes the question of marginal stability, and this goes back to the same question we have been talking about. Marginal stability is poles on the imaginary axis. So marginal stability means the poles on the imaginary axis. Asymptotic stable means the poles are here. So what is the condition for asymptotic stability? Negative real parts, right? Which means as long as my system is somewhere over here, the system is asymptotically stable. As soon as I go here, the system is marginally stable. And as soon as I cross this threshold, as soon as I cross this vertical line, the system becomes unstable. Now, the important question that needs to be answered is what is the stability margin? And stability margin means is how far can I sort of bend the rule to speak till system becomes unstable? So for that, I want to give an example. Imagine my system has poles here. And my, my, I have another system that has poles somewhere over here. So I have a system that has pole here and I have another system that has pole somewhere over here. Now, tell me which system is more stable. So I'm, is system A more stable? or system B more stable? Do you agree with me? System B is more stable. Which means the stability margin for system B is greater than the stability margin for system A. Are you with me so far? Now, remember when we looked at the control system analysis, the linear control system, the two important parameters that we study are something called as the gain 
and next thing is phase. So this stability margin can be represented or discussed in terms of gain margin and phase margin. Phase margin. And so if I were to explain what is gain margin and what is phase margin, is something like this. If I have a system, how much gain I can increase till the system becomes unstable? How much gain I can increase till the system becomes unstable? And I want you to visualize, the, remember the example that I gave you uh, for the root locus. You have a microphone, you have a speaker. How much gain you can, amplification gain you can increase before you form that internal loop and system becomes unstable. So that is sort of the gain margin. How much of gain I could increase till the system becomes unstable. And next thing is phase margin. How much of phase I can increase till system becomes unstable. So gain margin and phase margin, they are majors of stability margin and gain margin essentially is how much of gain I could increase so that the system becomes unstable and the phase margin is how much of phase I can increase till the system becomes unstable. And body plot is an excellent way to determine the gain margin and the phase margin. And I, at this point, rather than shifting to MATLAB, I want you to open the, the CISO tool, the last plot that CISO tool showed you. Last plot, the CISO tool showed you. On the left-hand side, it had the body plot. Are you with me? So first plot, top plot on the left-hand side is the magnitude versus frequency. Do you agree with me? The bottom part, I mean, the, the bottom chart on the left-hand side is the phase plot. Can you see there is something called as GM? GM in the magnitude plot stands for gain margin. Are you with me so far? And can you go down in the magnitude plot and the phase plot and see PM? That PM stands for phase margin. Are you with me so far? So the body plot can tell you what is the gain margin and what is the phase margin. Can you see uh, in one of those body plots, gain margin is infinity. Can you see that? Which means system is not going to become unstable if you were to increase the gain. Do you agree with me? That's what it means. But if you look at the phase margin for the same plot, it will tell you the value of the phase margin. Are you with me so far? And what does that say? What is the PM for the body plot? What is PM? 90? Negative 90? So what that means is if you were to increase the phase by minus 90, the system would become unstable. Are you with me so far? Now, this is an interesting question. NAN is uh, not a number. Do you have not a number for something? Yeah, so basically it's not a number because it can't calculate the number. So it's like one over zero or something like that could be happening. Okay, so we just looked at the body diagram and what I want you to do is, I want you to try the body diagram examples which are shown over here. So, and we did this body diagram. So once again, please try to understand body diagram tells you the output 
uh, the relationship of output with respect to input. If you change the input frequency, how does the output frequency change? If you change uh, in the magnitude of the output, uh, magnitude of the input, how does the magnitude of the output change? So you have the ratio of the magnitudes and you have the phase. So Bode diagram is going to give you the relationship between the amplitude and the magnitude and the phase. So what I want you to do is, since I have worked out so many problems, please quickly perform this body plot. So num is equal to 10, den is equal to 0 0.11, and do CISO tool TF4. And please verify that your body diagram looks something like this. So online students, quickly program this. The first line should be this, second line should be this, and the third line should be this. And after you are done, please see, please verify that your body plot looks like this. Does it look like this? Okay. Now let's analyze. So this 20 log 10, this is a positive number. Do you agree with me? So here it's positive. Here, it is negative. What does positive number mean? Positive number means amplification. You supply the input, the output would be amplified. So if you have a, a point over here, what that means is it is amplified. Then what starts happening over here? As soon as you cross this break frequency, then what you have is this amplification starts going down, 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 down. And basically you get attenuation. So at higher frequencies, it is attenuated. It is curtailed. It is minimized. There is no amplification. There is reduction. Everyone understood this? So from here to here, here to here, It's amplification. And from here to here, there is reduction. And as you can see, initially, the phase is uh, zero when we started. And gradually, it started becoming negative. Now, negative phase, which means the output started lagging. If it is positive, the output leads. And here, output lags.
Are you with me so far? So I'm going to stop here for 15 minutes. Uh, I'm going to stop recording. So what I have is I have an electric motor. This electric motor is attached to the gearbox. So what does this gearbox do? The electric motor runs at extremely high speeds, but very low torque, high speed, low torque. This gearbox will reduce the speed and increase the torque. And if you don't believe me, try to grab the D shaft and try to rotate it. It's hard. Okay. It's super duper hard. So this is the D shaft and this is the motor. At the end of the motor, there is something called an encoder. Can you see those, those two black things? Those are encoders. What do those encoders do? They provide a feedback. So think about it like you have the motor, which is the plant, and you have the encoder, which is the feedback. And then what we want to do is we want to implement a control logic for PID. Are you with me so far? Everyone understood this. Now here you will notice that there are these wires. What are these wires? So basically there are two wires which would power the motor. I will give you the pinout for the motor or actually I want you to do this quickly Google this motor number. So this motor has this serial number. Just Google and it will give you the pinout. What are these pins? You have one power, one ground. That is the power and ground for the motor. Okay. Then you are going to have four pins, four wires. So basically one is power, one is ground and other two are fall Hall effect output. So basically you can get the Hall effect sensor. So this is one Hall sensor and the second one is the other Hall sensor. So in today's class later, we are going to look at analog sensors and transducers. So what we have is we have an analog motor and we have a Hall effect sensor. So we are going to use this to control the motor. Everyone understood? online students. So we have this motor. There is this gearbox and there is this Hall effect uh, sensor. And then this is the motor. Everyone, any questions from my online students? So, so basically, can you see JGY 370? Google JGY 370. It's 12 volt DC. 40 RPM motor and the skew uh, is so just Google JGY 370 pin out. How do you control the motor? Motor is controlled by something called as the MOSFET. So anyone knows what a MOSFET is? MOSFET or the motor driver. So this is the motor driver. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to give one motor driver to each and every student in class. And then uh, I want you to open this motor driver and I will talk about the, the, the pinup, how to attach these. And if you come to class on Tuesday, I can, and if your system is not working or something, I'll help you debug. But first, let me give you the motor driver. One, two, three.
So this is also called as the MOSFET. So this is the motor driver. This is a motor driver. Now, this motor driver, as you can see, this is LN298 motor driver. You can actually Google and see how LN298N motor driver works. But if I want you to look at this motor driver, please notice there is out one, out two, out three, and out four. Are you with me so far? Out one, out two, out three, and out four. Can you see out one, out two, out three, and out four? So they are here. And then there is power, ground, and five volt. Can you see power, ground, and plus five? Are you with me so far? power, ground, and firewood. So what needs to happen is you can, even though it says uh, 12 volt, this will operate on nine volt. So I'm gonna give you this nine volt battery connector. You can connect this one to power uh, 12 volt, other one to ground. So this is how this needs to be power. Ground is in between two. So power, five volt ground. So if you if you look here, can you can you read it small? Teeny tiny. I'll come, I'll come. I have to. This one? Yeah, the six no, no, this one. Center. And last but not least, what I want to do is I want to give you some breakout boards that you may need to make connection. I mean, it's not necessary that you use these breakout boards, but just in case if you want to do this uh, circuits on these breadboards. So these are the breadboards. So which color do you like? You don't know? I don't have a color that is, I don't know. I have red, yellow, green, white. In case if you need breadboard, you can use the breadboard. And I have the, the hookup wires. Uh, so in case if you need a wire, I don't know how this one is doing it, but if you need wire, I have wire. It depends upon how you do want to do it. You can just uh, uh, if you don't decide if you decide not to use breadboard, then you don't need this wire. If you decide that hey, I want to use breadboard, then you will need to it. It's only up to you. And to be honest with you, uh, to make those connections, it's it will take some time. So what I want to do is, now I'm going to discuss what is this next assignment is going to be. And 
I would be honest with you. This assignment, I personally think, will actually help you learn a lot regarding the motor control, how to control it with Arduino, and so on. So the Arduino that you will use for this activity is Arduino Leonardo. Remember TC Lab Arduino? That is Arduino Leonardo. That is the one that you are going to use. Are you with me so far? Okay. So uh, what are we going to do? Uh, let me uh, just uh, go back to Zoom, share screen. Share screen. I'm good with share screen. screen. So go to University of Michigan. Control systems. So, and go to control tutorials for MATLAB and Simulink. Now, what I want you to do is, I want you to go to PID. And in PID, I want you to do this motor control activity. So this actually, this has two parts. Uh, if you want, there is part A, which is on the, the control that you can do. So let me see analysis, control, uh, motor control. Okay. So first I want you to read through this introduction to PID controller design. Your next assignment would be to first read this PID control uh, design. Repeat through this exercise. And then at the end, what we want to do is at the end, we want to actually implement this inside the, the motor control problem. So. If you go to PID, here there is motor control activity. Introduction PID control. Here you go to motor control activity. Now, what does this motor control activity look like? Please note that this motor control activity is controlling the position of the output shaft of the motor using some type of a PID control. So what I want you to do is, I just want you to read through this pulse width modulation, PI control, pole placement, steady state error, disturbance reduction, all these topics. So what are the equipments that we need? We need an Arduino board. You have Arduino Leonardo. We need a breadboard. If you need a breadboard, I just give you a breadboard. DC motor, with quadrature encoder that I gave you. Battery, I gave you the, uh, the ba battery uh, hookup, so you can actually use a nine volt battery. They say diode, if you want diode, I can give you diode, but diode is really not needed because the, the LN298, uh, this motor driver that I gave you, the motor driver that I gave you already includes the diode. So transistor MOSFET, you see this big heat sink. This is the MOSFET, LN298. This is the MOSFET. And what you can do is, we have this motor. We want to control this motor. So the it's the plant P. Controller is the program inside the Arduino Leonardo that will vary the pulse width. Then encoder is gonna read out what is the current position of the shaft and give the feedback to the reference. And then the error term would be calculated and accordingly uh, it will be adjusted. So please read through this. 
and here these are the performance specifications can you see that 2% settling time peak time of 0 0.5 seconds and maximum overshoot of 20% are you with me so far online students are you with me so what we want to do is we want to build this motor control so that these performance specifications can be met so how do we do it first of all what we want to do is we want to come up with a system identification so if you want to do the system identification you will have to complete something called as the time response analysis of dc motor so as you can go through this we have all the supplies and then you can actually do this mathematical modeling from the first principle and can you see that we got the transfer function for the motor and then if you go down it will actually tell you how to do this activity and what you have is you have a quadrature encoder and that quadrature encoder will actually give you the, the output but please understand that in this exercise they are using a transistor and they are using a diode we don't have to do this because we already have everything breadboarded or we have this motor driver so what you need to do is you need to supply the power you need to supply uh, the ground connect the motor to out one out two and then adjust the the point so you can see here that is the the cutouts so you have to adjust and basically you would be able to control the motor so i would upload uh, some video tutorials and some links on how to do a motor control with ln 298 that would actually show you how to perform this activity so you can actually go through this activity and you can actually do this whole thing inside arduino so matlab and arduino you should be able to do this activity are you with me so far this looks intimidating but trust me it's not because the codes are already given simulating codes are given you will have to modify you have to just make the connections and then finally you have to this or everything is given to you so you can actually create the the plant and then go to part b of this activity in part b of this activity what i want you to do is i want you to build on this arduino uh, simulating diagram and then implement a controller and here they will specify what type of controller we need to look at what should be the filter constant and what is the gear ratio so if you look at the spec for gjy370 it will tell you the gear ratio can you see that gear ratio here gear can you see the gear ratio this guy gear ratio so what you will do is you will look at the specs of this motor and then apply the gear ratio and then what you do is you can actually perform the analysis please try to understand here is p times i kp and ki divided by s is the proportional integral control so you can see this proportional integral control find out the values of the pid gains and then actually program or just do the implementation so basically you can do inside the simulink you can actually perform this whole experiment and then see if your response the motor response is as per the input that is given to you one important thing that i would want you to look at is integral wind up remember i talked about the integral wind up which is if you have a steady state error for a long time 
if you keep you can keep on integrating that constant and finally it becomes a big number and that uh, makes the system unstable when you do this experiment you will actually observe the integral wind up so basically that concept is not easy to grasp unless you play do it with hands integral wind up uh, yeah for for that to understand how it destabilize the system you will have to actually program and get this system done so you can see that integral wind up and then finally you want to implement a uh, disturbance rejection in other words what you will do is you will increase the gain margin and the phase margin using your controller so that the external disturbances can be reduced so then what you can do is you can actually program the microcontroller just we did with tc lab just flash the program to the microcontroller and then it will actually do the embedded control this lab this whole activity 6a and 6b would take somewhere between two to four hours depending upon how comfortable you are in programming how comfortable you are in Arduino, how comfortable you are in making connections. So my suggestion to you is, please try to do this over the weekend. If you get stuck, send me an email and I will be happy to meet with you in person or via Zoom on Monday. If you still are struggling, I will do part of this activity in class. But this activity, in my personal opinion, is super important. I did this myself. And to be honest with you, I learned a lot. Once you actually program the gains, once you tune the gains, once you do the control, then you will understand how the actual motor control works. So I want you to do this activity. But for some reason, if you are out of this country, or if you if you are for some reason you do, can't get hand on uh, the motor control motor controller on the hardware i will give you an alternate activity which would be answering uh, some theory questions so you would have a choice for your last assignment for the last and final assignment you will do this hands on activity that is preferred or you can do the the theoretical activity like answering the questions and solving some problems. Now, I want to ask this question. How many of online students are from Tempe? Please raise your hands. How many of online students are from Tempe? Okay. So Akash, uh, I will, and I think Shreya, so they are from Tempe. So uh, I would like to give their uh, uh, stuff, the motor, motor controller to someone uh, who would be a volunteer, who would coordinate with Akash and Shreya and give it to them. Mohammed? Okay. So I'm going to give your stuff to Mohammed. And what I would do is I will send you Mohammed, Shreya, uh, Akash, and Mohammed an email. So please coordinate with them and give it to them. Now, can somebody, if you guys want, you are welcome to stop by my office and pick it up. So anyone wants to stop by my office tomorrow and pick it up? Anyone? If you want to stop by my office and pick it up tomorrow, please send me an email and I would be happy to meet with you and give it to you. I would also post the link on Amazon. If you have Amazon Prime and if you order, if you want to order, I don't think that you should order, but if you want to order, then you're welcome to order it from Amazon. And I will give you, uh, I'll post the link. So today I'll post the assignment. What is to be done? I will also provide the rubric, like how it will be graded. I will also provide the link uh, 
to the parts that you can purchase on Amazon. They are like about $10, $15. But my only fear is that you may not, if you don't have Prime, you will not receive those parts on time. That's why I went ahead and ordered those. And please try to work on this over the weekend. This is super duper important because our classes are ending on Tuesday. So Tuesday is the last day officially we will be meeting. So try to repeat or try to do this exercise over the weekend. If you get stuck, send me an email. Let's meet in person on Monday or over Zoom. And I will show you how to do it. Or as a last resort, I will show it to you how to do it on Tuesday in class. Everyone okay with this plan? Online students, everyone understood? Okay, so I'm, before I leave today, I will give parts to Mohammed. Actually, I will give you spare, I'll give you three and I will send an email to the entire class that if they need to pick it up, uh, they can just collect it from you. You are in Tempe, right? Yeah. You, you will be in town this weekend, right? Yeah. Okay. And if you want, yeah, you can share your phone number with me. I can just put it, if you are okay with it, I'll just say, just text Mohammed and then uh, try to coordinate uh, picking it up. Do we need to share this? No, no. I just, this is, I said, I'm going to give you a gift. Right? This is my gift to you. Just, just use it well. Uh, okay. All right. Any questions from anyone? But please do this activity. This activity is super duper important because that will actually give you hands-on experience on control. Please note, this activity on an average takes anywhere between two to four hours. So if you can work in the groups of two to three, that will be fantastic. So for an example, if you form a group of two or three students and work on this activity together, uh, that will save you a lot of headache. If you try to work on, it, work on it on your own, no problem. Let me know by tomorrow if you need help. If you want, I can do a Zoom call over the weekend. I can do a Zoom call or I can meet you in person on Monday. And I will actually show you this activity in class on Tuesday. But please try to do this activity. Any questions? Questions from my online students? Okay. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to continue to the next part. So the next question is again, that is super critical, which is marginal stability. Marginal stability, which means the eigenvalues are on imaginary axis. Sometimes you want to increase the stability margin. That way you push the poles on to the left hand side that means make them more and more negative real parts now sometimes you encounter something called as the one zero condition so this one zero condition is kind of interesting so idea of one zero condition is your unit feedback is unity so if you think about it feedback your feedback is unity. Now, what can happen is this G of S, this G of S is considered as the loop transfer function. And what happens is the error that you feed in that error that you feed in because of the characteristics of transfer function basically gets inverted. The output gets inverted. And this is characterized by the phase angle 
to be minus pi, which is minus 180. So the output basically lacks the input by 180 degrees. Output lacks the input by 180 degrees. And that is because of this unity feedback and this transfer function. Transfer function magnitude is one, but only change that this transfer function is causing is adding a phase of minus 180 to the system. So that is something that you have to keep in mind and that is characterized by one zero condition. The next important part that we talked about is phase and gain margin. What is phase and what is gain margin? Phase margin is the amount of phase that you can include till the system becomes unstable. And the gain margin is the amount of gain that you can increase till the system becomes unstable. Now, how do you determine the gain margin and the phase margin? To find out the gain margin and the phase margin, here is what you do. You look at the Blody plot. So what you do is you look at the Blody plot. On Blody plot, you find where you have zero dB. 0 dB means whatever is the output, that is same as input. So input passes on to the output. Then what you do is, you basically draw a vertical line. And what you do is, this is the phase diagram. This is the phase. You will find out the difference between the phase and 180 degrees. You find the difference of phase whatever you have at the crossover frequency and the, uh, the one minus 180 degrees. This is called as the phase margin. And to find out the gain margin, what you do is you look at the phase plot and you see where this phase plot intersects minus 180. And there, what you do is you plot this vertical line and see where it intersects the gain plot. And you notice this difference, this is the gain margin. So how do you determine the phase margin and gain margin? So if you use MATLAB, MATLAB will do that for you automatically in the body plot. It will show you PM, which stands for phase margin, and will show you GM, that stands for the gain margin. So you have phase margin and you have the gain margin. So how do you find out the phase margin? Phase margin is where you have the crossover frequency, which means uh, your magnitude is actually zero dB. And uh, you draw a vertical line, see where it intersects with the phase plot and find the difference between the, the phase at that point and 180 degrees. And that difference is the phase margin. To find out the gain margin, look at the phase margin, I mean, look at the phase plot, see where that phase plot intersects with minus 180 degrees and basically draw a vertical line and find out the difference between these two. So that is given as the gain margin. Now, body plot, the information, the gain and phase information on the body plot can be represented on a single plot, which is called as the Naquist plot. 
So Nyquist plot is basically the information which is on the body plot, which is the gain and the phase. All that information can be combined and can be plotted on something called as the Nyquist plot. But for analysis purposes, body plot is sufficient. Okay. Now what I want to do is I want to take this simple example and this example is something like this. This is the open loop transfer function. This is the open loop transfer function. And this open loop transfer function has a unity feedback. So the loop transfer function is g times h. So this is the loop transfer function. And what we want to do is we want to find out the, the body plot essentially magnitude and phase, Nyquist, and then basically see the sinusoidal input. Now what we are going to do is we are going to solve this problem, not by hand, but we are going to solve this problem using MATLAB. And at this point, I want to introduce one more tool, the linear system analyzer. So what I want you to do is at this point, I want you to go to MATLAB and I'm going to share my screen. So Go to MATLAB and in MATLAB, online students, can you see my MATLAB screen? Then what I want you to do is, I want you to do this num10 is equal to 1, 3, then 10 is equal to 1, 4, 16, then TF10 is equal to TF num10 comma den 10. And then what I want you to do is you can do CISO tools. TF10 and then last part is linear system analyzer TF10. Online students, please enter this in your MATLAB.
so as you can see on the left hand side what you have is you have the body diagram on the right hand side you have the root locus then what you have is step input if you want to add some more plots then what you can do is you can actually go through this activity and there are lot of plots that you can add so if you want to add plots then you can add now there is additional activity that you can do here is you can actually use this to design the pid you can actually use the control system designer for optimization you can actually do loop shaping and so on and so forth so if you want to try the pid or something like that you are welcome to try doing this now the next tool which i want to show you is linear system analyzer so run this so here what you can do is you can actually you can look at different plots you can look at step impulse if you want this all these six plots so basically step impulse linear simulation initial condition pole zero all these plots you can actually plot at the same time so this is another important tool inside matlab that can be used for analysis so you click okay and it will actually give you all these plots so and then oh yeah I hope. so these so these are the different plots that matlab can generate for you so you can either use ciso tools or you can use the linear system analyzer and both uh, will be able to help you uh, design the system. Any questions here? Online students, were you able to get the, these plots? Okay, fantastic. Okay, so the next part, which I want to talk to you briefly is what something called as the control system compensation. Okay, now depending upon whom you talk to, people will give you different definitions of compensator. But if you ask me, what is a compensator? My definition of compensator is something similar to PID control. Now, what I want you to do is, I want you to think about for a second, if you have a, a proportional control, if you have a proportional control, which means you just have a constant. If you have a derivative control, which means you have a constant, another constant multiplied by s let me write this down so if you have a proportional control what you have is you just have k if you have a proportional and derivative control what you have is you have kp plus kd times s if you have a proportional and integral control kp plus k i s 
Now, what I want to do is, I want you to look at this simple function. So this becomes kp times s plus ki divided by s. Do you agree with me? Now this guy, if you think about it, what this is doing, it is adding a zero, adding zero and then adding a pole. Do you agree with me? So what is the zero that he is adding? This controller is adding zero s is equal to minus ki divided by kp. This is the zero that is being added. And what is the pole that is adding? s is equal to zero is the pole that is adding. Do you agree with me? Are you with me so far? So compensator is something similar, but compensator would add a pole and a zero at the same time. A compensator, just like the proportional and integral control, it will add a pole and zero at the same time. Do you agree with me? Can you see the, the similarity between the compensator and the proportional and integral controller. The only difference is you can see that the zero is cunable. So the zero here is S zero means when the numerator becomes zero, which is minus one divided by tau and the pole is s is equal to uh, minus one divided by alpha tau. Are you with me? So if someone asks you, what is a compensator? You can say compensator is something that would change the pole and the zeros simultaneously. How many poles would it add? It will just add one pole. How many zeros it will add? It will only add one pole. So one zero. So what does a compensator do? Compensator is something similar to a PID control. For example, just PI control. The only difference is in the compensator, you can actually tune the zero and the pole separately. Are you with me so far? Now remember when I talked to you about uh, derivative action and the integration action, if you add a derivative to the existing transfer function, what are you adding? You are adding a zero. If you add an integrator to the transfer function, what are you adding? You are adding one pole. So compensator is think about like simultaneous integral and integral and derivative action. But the difference is you can change the locations where the, the integration and differentiation is happening. That is where you actually change the zeros, uh, the, where the zero is and where the pole is. Are you with me? So if I ask you, what is a compensator? Compensator is something similar to a PID control. The only difference is it is in the most general form. The most general form wherein you can actually tune the zero and you can tune the pole. Everyone understood this? Any questions here? Now, some are, so what is the practical example of a compensator? So a practical example of a compensator is imagine uh, you are wearing shoes and those shoes, uh, they have hard sole. So as you walk, your feet 
may are uncomfortable because whatever is the ground reaction, that whole ground reaction is transferred to your body. So basically, you don't feel comfortable in those shoes. So what do you do? You find insoles, maybe those are gel filled or maybe cushioned insole that kind of soften the system. That, in other words, is a compensator. Because what happened by adding that cushion gel, you added, a pole, you change the system behavior. You change the pole and the zero of that system. That is a practical example of a compensator. Everyone understood this? So compensator is something that would simultaneously change the pole and zeros. A classic example is you are using the shoes that are with hard heels and then your shoes, you feel uncomfortable. Then what you do is you basically add a, a gelled cushion and that is sort of the compensator. Everyone understood this, but in the control system, that compensator would simultaneously change the pole and zeros. In other words, it will simultaneously perform the integration and differentiation. Are you with me so far? That is uh, the basic fundamental principle behind the compensator. There are two types of compensators. One is a lead compensator and then other one is the lag compensator. So basically what you do is when you add, when you have the lead, so how do you decide whether the compensator is a lead compensator or a lag compensator? I will give you a very simple definition. Lead compensator. So this is uh, your imaginary axis. Okay. This is sort of the pole zero diagram. So this is imaginary. This is real. Are you with me? And you design this compensator. And what I'm going to do is on this imaginary and real diagram, I'm going to plot the pole of the compensator and the zero of the compensator. Are you with me? I'm going to plot the pole of the compensator and the zero of the compensator. If you have the lead compensator, the pole is going to lead. So if you have a lead compensator, the pole is going to lead. If you have a lag compensator, the pole is going to lag. Are you with me so far? So relative location of the pole and the zeros of the compensator, they tell you whether it's a lead compensator or whether it's a lag compensator. So for lead compensator, these are the design specs. Say they will give you a specific phase margin and they will give you a specific steady state error. Then what you do is you follow the steps, you compute the loop gain, plot the body plot, determine the phase margin, and then see how much of phase margin movement is needed to achieve that type of compensation. And then you find out this parameter al A and then find out the compensator gain. And then you follow through these processes and then you can actually do a compensator design. But designing a compensator inside MATLAB is super duper simple. And I will show you how it is done. So next thing is you have something called as the lag compensator. Lag compensator is used if the bandwidth is sufficient and it can improve the steady state accuracy and stability. What are the advantages of lag compensation? Lag compensation improves the low frequency behavior and essentially it acts as a low pass filter. So if you look at the lag compensator, the lag compensator body diagram is shown like this. Uh, here are the design processes, step one, step two, step three, step four, uh, and step five. And you go all the way to the step eight. I would encourage you to take a look at these steps and that would show you how to design 
the lag compensator. The steps are similar to the lead compensator, but what I want to do is, uh, I want to actually uh, go to this example, which is the speed control system. And in the, you have this motor driving circuit, you have a low pass filter, you have a control command, you have a control amplifier, and then what you realize is unfortunately this performance was not achieved by just the gain alone. So what we want to do is we want to add a compensator network into the forward path. So what do I mean by forward path? Forward path means before the plant transfer function. So if this is G of S, what we want to do is we want to add the compensator here. And if you see, this is how that compensator structure is gonna look like. And if you want to design a compensator, there is a control system design toolbox. And that control system design toolbox has something called as the compensator editor. This compensator editor that would allow you to add the real gain or pole and zeros, it will allow you to add the phase. And basically once you add that to this control of the compensator design, you can actually quickly design the compensator. What you can do is you can actually, uh, you can run uh, through different analysis, what type of specifications that you need, and that should be able to help you tune the system. So what I want to do is, I want to go on to the MATLAB and actually uh, show you how this is done. So I'm gonna close my MATLAB windows real quick. So so the same toolbox, uh, CISO tool, you can use, you can use the CISO tool. You can use the CISO tool. I will uh, share my screen. Control system. Okay. And then what you can do is you can actually double click on compensator. And in compensator, what you can do is you can go to compensator editor and then you can actually add poles and zeros. So this stands for adding a pole, this stands for adding a zero. So what you can do is you can go to control system, tuning method, uh, root locus, you can do it with root locus or you can do it with uh, body plot, go click here, then double click. And what you do is you can actually uh, add the compensator in here. So right click, add a real pole or a complex pole or real zero or complex zero. So online students, can you see my screen? Online students, can you see my screen? Okay, so if you go to my screen, go to control systems, double click on the C, double click on the C. 
and then you will get this compensator editor right click on to the compensator editor are you with me so far and here it will actually show you what type of compensator you want to design do you want to design a lead compensator or you want to design a lag compensator or you want to design a lead and lag compensator which is not so basically you go to lead compensator and then can you see that it gave you a transfer function for the compensator and you can adjust where the pole and the zero of the compensator can be that will give you the required performance. So this is, and if you want to edit it, double click, it will show you where the real zero, it will show you where the real pole is, delta, and it will show you the frequency. Now, other thing that you can do is if you double click, you can, if you want to add, so uh, basically delete, right click, add poles and zeros and say lag compensator. And now what it will do is it will basically add the lag compensator. And that allows you to the location of the real pole, location of the real zero. And this is the compensator gain that you can tune. So MATLAB can allow you to do the uh, lead and lag compensator design very, very quickly. So that is how you can do the compensator design inside MATLAB. And what are we trying to do? So as you can see that once we add the compensator, once we add the compensator, if you change this, if you change the real pole, real zero, notice your phase margin and your gain margin would change. And that's what we would like to do. So basically by adding the compensator, you can actually change the poles and the zeros of the system. And you can actually tweak uh, the system performance. Everyone with me so far? So whatever we talked about, the compensator design techniques, uh, those uh, you can just implement, I mean, you can use MATLAB and do the compensator design. Any questions? Online students, were you able to design a compensator? The other thing what I want you to do is, if you go to tuning methods, I want you to go to PID tuning. And when you do the PID tuning, it will actually help you do this compensator design interactively. So if you go down, you can actually implement uh, whether whatever comp type of compensator you want, then you can update the compensator. It will actually change the system response. It will just give you the value of C. If you want uh, to do a PID. So same tool can be used to solve uh, the multiple problems. So I would encourage you strongly to work out these problems. Let me show you how you do it in frequency domain. So this is in frequency domain. So you can tune uh, the compensator and you can actually use that same tool for designing of compensator or you can use the same tool for design of PID control. And what I want to do is, uh, I want to work out, just kind of give you uh, ideas on 
few problems. So these problems are solved and discussed in the slides. So I'm gonna walk you through them. So when you get a chance, please work these problems out on your own. So this is the same problem from the textbook 12.21, a satellite tracking system is having the plant transfer function. This is the plant transfer function and this is the compensator. So this is the plant and this is the compensator. So this is shown over here and the feedback is unity. So the feedback is unity. So he's asking, write the closed loop function, route hard widths, find the compensator parameter, sketch the stability region and do the pools. So there are different ways of doing this. Either you can work out the math, you can write the characteristic equation one plus GS, GH and find out, construct the route array, find the stability or you can construct this region and you can actually look at the values. The second problem, I would encourage you to just take a look at it. This problem com can completely be solved using MATLAB. The only thing what you will do is uh, you would actually go to MATLAB, create this plant, create this transform uh, compensator function, and then actually uh, run this whole system uh, through the MATLAB. So this entire problem, which is hand solved using the hand calculations here, can be solved using MATLAB. I would encourage you to work this problem out using Control System Designer or CISO tool and see what answers you get. The second thing is, in this particular problem, it is asking us to plot the body plot for the derivative controller, which is nothing but same as derivative function, integrating controller, first order lag, PID. So basically we have in today's class, we worked out the derivative, we worked out the integrator. In last class, we, we did the first order simple lag and we did the proportional plus derivative control in last class. And you would notice these are the body plots for those uh, systems. The next problem is 12.8. You have a feedback with a TACO feedback, PPD servo, and we have to design for specifications uh, of peak time and percentage overshoot. And you can work out through this problem and then just verify the answers. And the last part is you have this control system. This is unstable and we want to design the P control, PID control, uh, and so on. So you can use the PID toolbox inside the MATLAB to work these problems out. And then there is one more problem, 12.36, which is again on the compensator design. And I have solved this problem by hand, but please try to work out this problem with the MATLAB tool that I showed you. If you have any questions, I will work this problem again in class uh, next time. There is a last problem, which is a speed control problem, which is we are designing the proportional control. You can do this complete problem using the root locus, the technique that I discussed in last class. And please verify that this is, these are the answers that you get. So uh, with this, we have finished uh, the chapter on control systems. And this is the most important chapter. So the the important chapters from the, the textbook, which are super important to mechatronic system, is dynamical systems, performance analysis and characterization, and then the chapter on uh, the control systems. The next chapter, which is kind of a theory chapter, which you can 
quickly read through it and you should be able to understand. But please try to understand that the, the exercise, the, the, uh, the next project that we are working on is actually hands-on dealing with analog transducers, which is the motor and the analog uh, feedback control systems, which are like the Hall effect sensor. So please do this exercise. Uh, I will actually go and update the assignment onto the canvas. So the assignment is gonna, are gonna have two parts. You can do either of those. Either you can focus completely on the theory, answer the theory questions, or alternatively, you can do this hands-on activity. I would strongly recommend to, for you to do this hands-on activity, uh, but if you don't have time or if you don't have access to this equipment or um, supplies, you are welcome to do the theory activity. With that, I'm gonna stop here and I would be happy to 